So today is March 30th, 2021, and it's our first HEAL project, Skillshare. Uh, and today, Rida is going to be going first. We're all taking turns uh, sharing uh, something uh, about some sort of skill that we wanna um, um, talk about. And then afterwards, we'll um, come together and discuss what everybody has shared. All right, so Rida. Okay. so. I was going to do a presentation on burnout. Burnout, if you all, I was just going to go over the definition is when is a multifaceted state of mind that manifests with emotional, mental, and physical symptoms. It's generally caused by prolonged and repeated emotional stress. While burnout is generally associated with work, it can also be seen with parenting, caretaking, and romantic relationships. So some of the symptoms of burnout, which I'm sure you all know, are their emotional symptoms of so things like feeling close to crying or angry a lot of the time, feelings of emptiness, anxiety, depression, aimlessness, fear and overwhelm, pulling away emotionally. And there's also physical symptoms, which usually these physical symptoms have no particular cause. So the things like low energy, headaches, back aches, stuff like that. Then there's also symptoms that manifest into your work. So there's things like you feeling like you have to do something, feeling like you're not doing enough, feeling like you dread going to work, feeling like you're not acknowledged, low interest, stuff like that. And then there's also ones that spill over into your regular life, depending on where your burnout is coming from. So there's lack of interest in social activities, difficulty with health habits, neglecting your own needs, not knowing how to do anything besides work. And a big one is when you do want to relax, it's hard for you to relax because you feel guilty about it. And also having no boundaries with work. And then the overall arching thing is like denial of these feelings and symptoms because, yeah. And so I wanted to go over some models of burnout that have been made by psychologists, which I'll go over briefly, but this is just interesting to me because I'm like a nerd when it comes to psychology stuff. So the 12 phases of burnout, which was made by Herbert Frudenberger and Gail North, so the first phase is you feel super excited and ambitious. You want to do everything and anything. Then you start pushing yourself to work harder and harder and harder and harder. Then you start neglecting your needs like self-care, sleep, exercise, eating. Then you put the blame on others about why you're not taking care of yourself. You're like, oh, it's my boss's fault that I'm not taking care of myself and stuff like that. Then you start not making time for non-work related things like friends, families, rejecting social invitations. And even when you do do them, you feel burdensome. Then you have denial, impatience, and blaming others. The seventh one is you feel further withdrawn from friends. Then comes the behavior changes. So you start snapping at people easily. You start getting angry easily. Then you start having depersonalization. So you feel like very detached. You start dissociating. You feel like you don't have control over your situation. Then you have inner emptiness or anxiety. So usually when people have this, they use thrill-seeking behaviors to feel something because they have the emptiness, which can be, yeah. And then depression and then mental or physical collapse. So that's like one model of burnout made by that person. Then there's another model that goes through the stages of burnout. So it's basically just like milder symptoms. So more like mental fatigue, physical pain, feeling like you're behind, dread. Then there's longer lasting symptoms, which is stage two, which is like disillusionment about job, feelings of boredom. And then stage three, which is severe. So that can like turn into health disorders or psychiatric disorders. There's stuff like substance dependence, shorter life expectancy, and high job turnover. Then there's the last model I'm going to go over, which is the three components of burnout. So this person, Christina Maslach, um, made a model basically separating all the symptoms. So the first component was exhaustion. So just overall physical exhaustion, mental exhaustion. Then there's cynicism, so a lot of depersonalization, distancing yourself from people, detachment, 
And usually persistent cynicism means that you've lost connection, enjoyment, and pride with your work. Then there's inefficacy, which are feelings of incompetence, lack of achievement or productivity, feeling like you won't be able to do things. And usually that comes from not having support and resources and clear expectations and autonomy and good relationships to be able to ask for that support when you do need it. So those are the three models I wanted to go over. And now there is how you can prevent this. So there's like a lot of things you can do to prevent it. And a lot of it is like self-care stuff. So like one would be rediscovering your purpose with work. So like a lot of the time when people feel disillusionment with their work, it's like if you try to kind of like list out the reasons why your work helps people and that type of thing, it usually helps. And also performing a job analysis. So a lot of when people have burnout, it's because they don't have clear expectations. So like writing out what expectations you think you have and then checking with whoever is giving you these expectations. And appreciate and help people in small ways. So like doing small favors. I thought there was a really cute little thing that was in one of the websites I found that was like having appreciation and gratitude lists for your coworkers in your workspace. So if like you do feel stressed, you can remember that they're like amazing people and they share the same values as you and passion as you. And another thing is taking control because a lot of burnout relates to not having control over, over your situation. So it's stuff like managing your time efficiently, prioritizing to-do lists, just so that you don't feel overwhelmed. Exercising regularly, using stress management techniques like meditation and breathing, changing up your routine. So like if you like always wake up at a certain time and you feel like you've gotten like stale with that, like waking up at a completely different time and doing work at a completely different time can really help. Um, prioritizing self-care, taking breaks, asking for help and creating boundaries around your work. So those are just some of the ways you can prevent it. So then I went deeper and thought about how, we, how you could implement this into an organization. So one of the things that I saw was reviewing work plans and planning and assessing workloads. So establishing mechanisms to assess the workload and scale back, like figuring out how many hours each person is working. Is it beyond what their capacity is? Did they track their hours? And assessing the workload and scaling back projects until you feel under control with the burnout. And then also like creating a moratorium on new projects until your capacity expands. So not taking on new things until you really feel like you can do it. Um, conflict mediation strategies put in place. Being transparent so that everyone knows what everyone is doing so that people don't feel like, yeah, I feel like that's self-explanatory. And giving clear and concise feedback that really explains what needs to be done and having time for questions and clarification. Accountability systems put into place evaluations regularly so people can hear about what's going well and what needs support. Um, and this one was like nice too, just like spending time together, having check-ins that are silly, bringing attention to wellness, building trust and care into relationships so that they're strong enough to be able to ask for help when the time comes. Um, and then the last one for this section would be facilitating meetings in ways that maximize participation of all group members. If there's a danger that a couple of people will dominate a conversation, making sure to have a system in place to deal with this. A good suggestion would be to use a go around rather than having people volunteer to speak and giving people the same amount of time to speak. So a big part of this is how we handle stress. So like stress management techniques are important. But the thing is sometimes you have automatic responses when you feel stressed. So like you can have feelings of fear, anger, feeling stuck, feeling anxious, feeling shame, sleep disturbances, irritability, even working when you are exhausted, criticals of others. Then when people try to ask you for help when you're stressed, usually you have a different reaction than if you are well, resource. So sometimes people become fixers. Sometimes people freeze up and don't do anything. Sometimes people escape. Sometimes people are like, see me. 
like I want the attention, even though like another person is stressed. Some people get overwhelmed and some people also minimize what the other person is going through. But when you do feel resourced, it's much easier to be responsive and compassionate and sensitive and caring and open and curious and competent because you have the resources you need and you feel real rested and be able to help people in that way. So something I thought we could think about is what we need when we feel stressed. So like if you need to be asked questions and not given advice, if you need to be given advice, if you need time alone, if you need words of affirmation, if you need help with these next steps. So I was thinking what one thing we could reflect on is like what we need when we're stressed and what we don't need when we're stressed because there's some people like I know I don't always want advice. I just sometimes want people to listen. And when people give advice, it's like not what I need. And sometimes it doesn't apply to my situation. So, and another thing, another big part of this is implementing a system to avoid and prevent a lot of these things. So on top of like doing the analysis that we're gonna do from the retreat, like maybe having like a weekly assessment or like a monthly assessment of our workload, what was stressful, what felt easeful, what did we feel excited about? What wasn't that exciting? And tracking what makes like ourselves feel stressed and like what the underlying fear is can also just help with like day-to-day -day stressors. And another thing is including team building and getting to know each other in our air meetings, which is um, like Aredvi, Ignacio and Rita. Those are like our weekly meetings that we call them air meetings. Um, and rotation of mini discussion facility topics, favorite animals, news, anything we'd wanna share about. And then sharing good and maybe some not good things that happened to us during the week, just like a kind of like a check-in like we already have. And the last thing is creating boundaries about work. So first creating those boundaries, like I will not check work text or email before this time or after this time. I'm gonna sleep for this long. I'm not gonna skip meals, stuff like that. So like having those written out and then also like assessing like weekly or like as often as you want to, to see if you have like respected your boundaries and then trying to like put in things that will help you respect your boundaries better. Yeah, I said a lot, but that's all I had for y'all. That was great. Awesome. That was great. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, Reda. This was wonderful. I love the slides you've made. And, and it seems like you have some notes too. I want all of it. This is so uh, beautiful. And um, so much of it resonated with me. So my topic for this Skillshare meeting was perfectionism. And this one was, um, I picked this one because um, it's definitely been something that I, I would say I've struggled with personally throughout my, my life. Uh, and I've tried to be intentional about addressing it. I'm very self-conscious of it. And um, I, think, I, I think maybe in, in some form, it also was pointed out to me in our work that maybe the way that I show up in the work uh, you know, has elements of perfectionism in it. So it was, I really appreciated the feedback and it was important for me to do more work around it. Uh, and to be honest with you, because it's a sensitive spot for me, um, I, I'm a little bit obsessing over uh, perfect, per, in other side of perfectionism, obsessing over uh, figuring out how to not be perfectionist. So I've prepared a very imperfect presentation for you. <laughs> Um, I was really inspired by some of the work that Dean Spade had done on perfectionism, which also overlaps with the ideas of how uh, perfectionism is a symptom of white supremacy culture or capitalistic cultures, uh, as well as also Dean Spade's work around, you know, overwork, being overworked or feeling overwhelmed uh, around specifically social justice work. Um, generally speaking, perfectionism, so the go to definitions of it. Is, on, is has been understood differently in different contexts. And I even delve into some like philosophical definitions of it, where like perfectionism is uh, like there are two aspects of it. One is the idea that, uh, you know, it, it, human beings should strive for this ideal of being. And there is this one way of being that is the 
best way of being for all humans, right? Um, and then within that, there's like people who say, no, well, you know, every person has their own perfect way of being, but then they should be striving towards their own perfect way of being, as opposed to there is one way to be, everybody should do it that way. And then the other school of thought about around perfectionism is perfectionism around what we create. So uh, to want what, you know, the, the idea that we are not perfect as humans, I can never be, but what we create can be, and we should strive for what we create to reach that level. I think that's like more of a mainstream uh, idea of perfectionism and uh, self-reflecting on that. I know I've, like as, as someone who's very much grew up in a culture of attaching my self-worth to what I do and what I achieve, um, I think it, it, it both of those have shown up for me both as in like I've definitely internalized a lot of stuff around how I can be perfect as a human and also how what I create can be perfect because what I create reflects on who I am as a human and so the perfection of both kind of is, is has been tied together for me um so that's kind of like one I think aspect of it and in the kind of the work that I've done to go away from that is to detach myself um, or the idea, not just for myself, also for others, the idea that the creation and what we do is a reflection of who we are, right? It's like we make mistakes and everybody makes mistakes. And it is just that we are not mistakes. Um, and we are just human and not being perfect is what actually makes us um, real humans, right? And whoever denies this, I think I'm at a point where like, whoever denies this reality is not only delusional themselves, unfortunately, but is unfortunately suffering from similar kinds of trauma of um, attaching self-worth to external measures. So that's one aspect of perfectionism. And then um, what I found really helpful, this is through the work of something I found on Surge uh, showing up for racial justice website around characteristics of white supremacy culture. And there is a section on perfectionism as one of the characteristics of white supremacy culture. And I really like the definition of here because I think it really expands that idea of like perfectionism as just what's perfect, what's not perfect, let's all be perfect and makes it a little bit more digestible. So here are some of the characteristics uh, little appreciation expressed among people for the work that others are doing and that appreciation is expressed um, only for those who get most of the credit anyway. So um, this idea that, you know, only appreciation should only come when we have created something basically like I, I could be breadcrumbing appreciation right it's like bread, which is actually it's, it's kind of the way I was raised as well right it's very interesting like I would only get appreciation or praise for high 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 level achievement not for just regular achievement <laughs> um, and then more common is to point out how a person uh, or work is inadequate. So basically just the idea of seeing the, the empty half of the glass. Um, and to talk about inadequacies more uh, and to talk about other people's inadequacies as opposed to talking to them directly about it. Um, and to see mistakes as something that are personal so that they reflect badly on who you are as a human being as opposed to what they are, which is that mistakes. Um, and then the idea that making a mistake, so right, making a mistake is confused with being a mistake, doing wrong is confused with being wrong. And I think that shows up in the way like we criticize and the language of offering criticism, which is instead of criticizing the work, we, we talk about it as if the person is just inadequate and cannot do better. Um, and this one is little time, energy or money goes into reflecting or identifying lessons that can be learned from the mistakes to improve it. Um, because the idea is that the mistakes are not things we can learn from and improve ourselves, but rather this, this is just how we are. This is just how you are or I am. We are just you know, inadequate. Um, so that was really helpful to me. And then some of the antidotes that were offered um, by by this website was developing a culture of appreciation where we take time to make sure that again, similarity with the burnout to really 
strongly work on a culture of ap appreciating small efforts and big efforts and everything, every work that goes into uh, getting the work done. Um, developing a learning organization. So it's kind of like what we're doing right now is like focusing on actually setting aside time to, to learn, um, not just like what we put outside uh, as the face of the work, but also how our relationships are going. Um, and then looking at mistakes as an opportunity to do things differently, to improve the work, to uh, as an opportunity, basically as a, as a point of learning and creating things from the mistake that could uh, further help everybody. Separating the person from the mistake, offering feedback, and uh, speaking well about the work before offering criticism. So basically seeing all sides of the work and not just what went wrong. And then asking people to offer specific suggestions for how to, we can to do things differently, um, as opposed to, um, for example, just criticizing. I mean, like, I don't like this, this doesn't work. Um, having that come with some suggestions as to, well, how could this be different? It made me realize that a lot of these behaviors, like in, in our group, we already, because of our values and so much of the conversations we've had, I feel like, we do so much of this already and um i felt much better about like that we don't we don't i don't think we engage in in perfectionistic uh behaviors but there's definitely i think because we live in a capitalist white supremacy culture there is always that outward pressure to uh, go in that direction so being conscious of these patterns i think is very helpful uh this handout Perfectionism reflection worksheet that the institute has created. Let me see if I can share my screen. Uh, basically, it's a set of it's a nice table with a set of measures for how perfectionism, the rules and assumptions of perfectionistic behavior. I won't read all of it, but maybe some points from this, and then there are some questions at the end that I thought would be really great to maybe talk more about as a group, or um, if if we end up doing like a assessment thing incorporated into that. Um, so setting more demanding standards, right? So like not just doing work that's good enough, but having to, to always do better um, to achieve higher and to produce more and more and get more praise. And then fear of failure um, and to the feeling that you have to do things perfectly. And then uh, if you can't do it perfectly, basically don't even bother doing it. Uh, that you can risk having others, you know, think poorly of you and um, yeah, and feeling that, you know, if, if you put yourself out there, you make a mistake, that's going to reflect really badly on you and the organization. All or nothing thinking, uh, avoiding conflict or feeling that the conflict uh, can ruin their relationships if they show up. Um, this is like, you know, all aspects of life around getting grades, <laughs> uh, feeling that work isn't good enough. I think that goes into like imposter syndrome for me um, and that there is one right way and one wrong way to do things. Using like should, shoulds and musts language, I must be perfect or other will realize who I really am, imposter syndrome again. And uh, feeling that you know, you have to know everything. If you don't know anything, it's a reflection on you. We have constant checking um, from checking your appearance to checking your work, to going over everything over and over and making sure everything is always perfect without any uh, mistakes made. Um, Self-control is another one, having to work all the time, fear of being a lazy slob. <laughs> um, and not you know, feeling like you have to work hard without giving yourself rest. Then structure and control, um, basically controlling behavior and feeling like you know, if you do more, then mistakes can be avoided and um, not letting others in to do tasks or take risks and doing things a different way, which also can show up as procrastination, apparently on the other side of it, where you're basically just like so afraid of making mistakes where you just avoid doing things because you don't want to be humiliated. You don't want to fail. You don't, you just overwhelmed with shame and uh, grief and guilt that you don't go along with things. Uh, I think 
if I want to simplify perfection, simplify perfectionism, and the way it shows up, the, the thing that spoke to me the most was the the test. I guess would be in a, in a working environment is if I I am afraid or I'm hesitant to try new things or do things differently or say my ideas because I feel like it may not be good enough and it might not, not be received uh, or welcomed by the group um, in a way that is, you know, that reflects on me not being good enough. So like that feeling, it's, it's a feeling that's familiar to me. So like I'm checking in with myself, like, is this how I feel when it comes to group work? So anyways, after this list, there are some questions here that kind of go deeper into how perfectionism shows up in different aspects of life and what is the cost of perfectionism. So reflecting on that um, as well as um, how are we applying perfectionistic ideas to others? Uh, and where did we learn these? How we can undo them? Uh, what are the emotions behind them? And what is the cost of that to the relationships we have with others, especially in the work environment? So, I really found that helpful. And the last two things I would share with you that I, it's kind of overlaps with the burnout. I found these two um, assessments that I will leave in our Skillshare Slack channel for us that may be something for us to look at and as a resource or incorporate into our um, work assessments. One is an overwork self-reflection worksheet um, that basically has some questions about how we're feeling about the work and stuff. We can assess ourselves around it. I think it's about two or three pages of it. And then another one is what I do under pressure self-assessment. These are both created by Dean Spade, um, which helps, I think, you know, figure out where we're under, under stress. How do we manage that? What shows up for us? And it's, again, it's a, it's a little worksheet like that. So those are some resources that I would love to share and work on later on with you all. <laughs> yeah. Still recording, good. <laughs> How do you feel about giving that presentation already? <laughs> I, I felt like it was too perfect. <laughs> <laughs> no, but joking aside, I just really honestly, it is a hard topic for me. So and um and, and and i'm not like right now where i am in generally i am not in the most grounded place so like it, it is not like a highly triggering subject but my threshold is a little bit low right now so even like hearing this stuff around burnout and over being overworked and then this stuff around perfectionism it's a little bit again it's, it's bringing up some feelings like oh my god like i'm not doing good enough right it's like that's it's, it's become a cycle uh, and then I just have to keep reminding myself that even that is fine right I don't need to like feel guilty about how guilty I feel about <laughs> how like perfect I'm being a perfectionist like it, it just gets a cycle and just so I'm in this process of figuring out how to break it mm -hmm. it makes me feel it makes me think of you know um you're talking like about you know you uh, working through perfectionism as you know personally mm -hmm. and so like as a group as a project then you know later thinking about then who, how do how do we help you you know how can we support you in that you know when you're struggling with that like how do we notice it how do we help out and I think that would be around what you would want right what do you want to hear what would be helpful to you so you creating that um, um, to tell us so that we can notice and, you know, be like, stop it, Red V. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the piece of it that, like I said, is most important for me in terms of our work is making sure, um, like, the, I think the boundary that I would love to prioritize, and I, if there's one thing to take away from this, is that I never want any of us, right, like, like, let's say, like, I'm, I'm going to focus on myself here. So like if I have a tendency to engage in perfectionistic behavior patterns, I never want that to um, put either of you in a position of feeling like you cannot share, you cannot participate, or you cannot uh, suggest things or criticize or give feedback. We will basically just show up in this work because of the fear of how I may see it as 
less than perfect, right? Like, so what I would say, if, if you ever feel like you have that feeling like, oh, you know what? I had this thought, this idea, this suggestion, but if I say it already, we might um, put it down or like put it down in a way that is not respectful and helpful. Um, I would like that to be called out if you feel like you have the energy for it, right? Because to me, it's very important that that does not happen and um, I can learn to figure out what, what behaviors of mine might be creating that kind of environment. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would, I think I'll add to that too, that is, I literally want to talk to the both of you about this in connection to what we're talking about is the, you know, when we say, I want somebody to tell me about the thing, right? So we're talking about uh, an accountability practice, not just the response to something afterwards, but everything before it, right? The, the, the structure that we're building. And so um, that's why I, I kind of go back to uh, what would be most helpful for you. So like for instance, I get that. Yeah, if you do that, I should say something. But what's the best, how is the best way to say it, right? Because there's a, a whole bunch of different ways to say it. I could be like, a red video being a perfectionist, you know, and be silly. And, but that might not, that might not fly with you. Maybe it's too sensitive for you and joking about it can be a trigger, right? So, uh, you know, like I, I was thinking about this in terms of care and the ways I'm actually developing this little web of care thing and giving like a, a grid on how we can ask for help sometimes without words, you know, just like um, setting up a structure where, like we already know, a Revy struggles with perfectionism. So this is on our radar. And when a Revy does this, then we already know these are the five things that Revy said that we can do. So we're accessing those five. We already have to think about it because you've already structured this for us. So I'm thinking maybe in that way, the, what is the most helpful for you um, what can we say or do? It could be one word. It could be, you know, yeah. whatever it is, an emoji on a fucking text or something. But <laughs> right. Something that makes us feel like we are able to say what we need to say, but that you could also, you could also hear it and accept it without the trigger because there's a real, there's a real trigger there. So, you know. Right, right. I would, I appreciate that so much. And I want to think more about it. What I would say is that you're right. Just saying, just saying, hey, you're being perfectionistic it would only trigger me and not help me figure out what to do about it. Um, but saying being, a I think being a specific as to like what exactly I did or like how exactly, actually telling me like how you're feeling, right? Like I'm feeling a certain way and I'm being specific about like what I did, what I said that created that um, could be, I, I really appreciate that kind of like very inform informative form of communication. And, mm -hmm. and, and um, yeah, and, and it doesn't have to be around perfectionism in general. I appreciate that kind of feedback where um, you share the impact on yourself and also offer like, if you're able to identify what it is that uh, I may have done to create that feeling. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the stuff you said like really spoke to me. Like, I feel like I'm also very much a perfectionist and <laughs> do struggle with that in a lot of ways. So yeah. And I'm like excited to kind of like figure out like how we can like put a structure in place. So like, I can act, like, I like tell you how I like asking for help and like, yeah, so I'm just excited about all the things. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Now we're moving on to conflict resolution. <laughs> okay, let me show my Green. Let's see if I can do it. Uh, my portion is conflict resolution. And so what I did was I did a whole bunch of research on conf conflict resolution. And um, there were like 50 different kind of ways that people look at conflict resolution. So what I did was cut and paste the things that I liked and agreed with. So these are from all different kinds of uh, places. A lot of these things are um, stuff that's uh, repeated over and over and over. You know, like I, I said, here's the five steps, here are the seven steps, here are the 10 steps to conflict resolution. Also, a lot of the conflict resolution stuff that I found was really focusing on um, big companies and organizations. 
So one of the things that I think that we have a, I guess a good, um, what's a good thing about us is that we are small. And so I think that because we're small, just right now, three of us and maybe maybe four or five one day, but no more than that, I think we have a, a we, we would have, hopefully, I would think, a better handle on conflict resolutions because there's not as many, you know, people, there's not 200 people, 100 people, 50 people in an organization. So that makes it a little better for us. So I'm, I'm happy about that. <laughs> um, and so I'll just read a little bit of stuff here. So like, it says like conflict resolution arises from a clash of uh, perceptions, goals, or values. And then that um, the seeds of conflict may be shown in con uh, confusion about or disagreement with the common purpose and how to achieve it. So a lot of that stuff kept coming up about what is the common purpose? What is our goal? It's about an alignment that we have. And I think uh, when we're not in alignment, um, there's a lot of confusion on top of a lot of other things. So components of conflict, some of these are in black and some of these are in red and there's a reason for that. The ones that I put in red felt to me like something that was, uh, I don't know, maybe a capitalistic model, something that we've talked about a lot, something that we are working towards not having be a part of this, of our, you know, um, working group. So some components of um, conflict is communication, the way people communicate with one another, right? The way people are either very um, open and honest um, or not. Um, so communication is huge right here because I think one of the things when we were um, thinking about hiring someone new, even with the advisory board, one of the questions we, ask is communication like how do you communicate how do you best take in um, information um, to hear this information uh, right so and in this right here just communication i think we have a good um, um I guess we have a lot of good uh opportunity um to continually to continually look at how we communicate with one another um, because we're so small and so that we can really assess and dig deep into how we function with one another. Um, can y'all hear that mower, lawn mower outside? Okay, great. Um, then uh, competition. So competition was one that I would see, I think I would see in a bigger organization, you know, um, not very much here, right? But competition for for limited resources that that's around a you know capitalist framework around limited resources and stuff and so although I think here we struggle for money and getting the money that you know we want to get in order to do the work that we do um, I think it's less about us struggling to fight against each other for limited resources it's more about what we're trying to provide for people but depending on how many people we do do come you know into the hill project that could be a possibility but although i feel like we really did a good structure in terms of like how we kind of share responsibility how we come up with new projects or ideas or you know um doing that i think we kind of cycle that really nicely so that uh competition uh, i don't think really um seeps into that um, inco um inconsistency associated with the need to know and understand company rules and policies they should not have to guess inconsistency is the in the workplace is a common source of conflict so i think we're pretty good here and we're always developing how you know who we are what are what are the policies how do we want to show up in this work for each other and for the wider world our constituencies and all that stuff so I think we really talk about this on a regular basis so I, I'm really happy with that uh, diversity I put that in red because um, here this is a uh, team members need to understand their own style and learn how to accept different styles conflict can also be caused by different personal values um, and so forth and so on and so here again uh, we have really talked about, you know, and we continue to talk about values, you know, uh, what we value in the world, um, what we want to see in the Hill Project, um, even how we partner with other people, ethics, value and stuff. And I'm glad that we talk about that consistently. Um, and that um, 
And I think that we do understand that we have different styles of being, but I think the, um, I think we work pretty well with accommodating how we are. And I think also because we're coming from a space of trying to be very transparent and, and, um, and like uh, intentional, you know, like a red V you're saying right now, I struggle with perfectionism. You're owning it, you're speaking it, and then we're, we're all witnessing it. And we're gonna um, try to help with that as you help yourself and we're working as a team, right? So I think that um, we do understand our difference and then we work to help one another with that. Um, perspective, just as two or more workers can have conflicting styles, they can also have conflicting perspectives. Uh, I also think that we do well with this too. I think that there have been moments where we have different views or ideas about a, a, a certain topic or the way that we should go. And I think we have a good, uh, we have a very good way of listening to one another um, and really uh, thinking about all what, what's the greater, what is the best thing for the project. Um, I think we do a good job of, of that. Uh, interdependency uh, says the more often people interact, the more um, potential there is for conflict. Uh, I, I felt kind of weird about that, but I understood that, you know, because I think like, again, they're thinking about a bigger organization. So lots more and more people, but the way they wrote it, the, the more often people interact, the more potential there is for conflict. I get it. And there's so much more potential for other things as well, right? Uh, and then conflicting uh, pressures can occur when two or more associates or departments are responsible for separate actions. Oh, I forgot to take something out of there. Um, yeah, the interdisciplinary requires for people to understand other points, people's other points of view, right? That you are uh, part of a bigger, a bigger working group, right? That this is not just you, right? And I think we also do that too, because we talk about what our workload is and we do our weekly meetings and what components are in there and how we'd like to change um, that. Uh, and then emotional intelligence, uh, which I thought was really great that they had that in here. Emotional intelligence is a personal attribute that is very um, useful in reducing conflict. Um, and it says the amount of an individual's emotional intelligence is referred to as the person's emotional intelligence uh, quotient or EQ. People with high EQs are empathetic and sensitive to feelings of others. Dealing with associates of um, dealing with associates of human beings with real lives are often overlooked in busy workplace. People with high emotional intelligence can do this in a professional manner while maintaining appropriate boundaries. So, uh, and when I think about this, I think about the actual work that we do, because this is something that we talk about all the time about emotional intelligence and where does emotional intelligence come from and how um, we kind of talk about, this is something that we need to be like honing in on from childhood, right? The ways in which we raise our children and also the prevention work that we do. So emotional intelligence, um, something that uh, something that we're always working on to to be um, sensitive and empathetic to other folks. Um, and then, so I, so I got here overall conflict resolution guidelines, and I won't go through all of them, but it's like um, define acceptable acceptable behavior. So us thinking about what is acceptable behavior here, and I think we talked about that a lot with kind of like how we deal with things, what is our ethic, what is, what do we believe in, uh, and how do we interact with other people. Don't, don't avoid conflict, of course, if there is conflict, the, the best thing to do is bring it out and talk about it, because the more we hold it in, the more it festers. Um, offer guidance, not solution. And I think this was more about like a project manager type person, like if you're if you're the one guiding what's happening instead of like giving solutions, just guiding people to get to where they need because we can work things out and process through it. Um, constructive criticism, um, that's really important. And it, it talked a lot about like people under, like people um, getting to a place where they could actually hear constructive criticism and then giving constructive criticism because it's for the overall, you know, betterment of the, you know, the individual and the, and the group or company. Um, don't intimidate, of course. I mean, that goes without saying. Right? <laughs> and then conflict resolution strategies. Um, 
that um, it was, it's a model that's um, Thomas and Kilman. Um, they created this model and it, uh, it identifies two dimensions that people fall into when choosing conflict resolution strategies, either assertiveness or, or cooperativeness. And so um, this, uh, these uh, approaches to resolving conflict are avoiding, um, accommodating, compromising, competing, and collaborating. Um, so you could avoid, that's pretty obvious, right? You can avoid the thing, um, you can accommodate, um, and that's when you satisfy the other person and really not yourself, right? You can compromise um, where uh, you're not entirely satisfied with you know, the outcome. Um, there can be some um, competing or there's collaboration. So I really like the way they broke that down because those are, when I first read it, I was like, um, these are not resolving conflicts, but these are the things that people use to resolve conflict, right? So here's seven steps for an effective problem solving process, which one, two, three, four, five, it's identify, um, understand, list, evaluate, select an option, document the agreement and evaluation. So when we were talking about maybe set, you know, um, checking in about our, you know, if we are having burnouts or anything like that, this little uh, evaluation I think is really nice. So identify the issue, um, you know, be clear about what the problem is and um, remember the different people might have different views, um, separate the listing of issues from the identification of interests. So, uh, and the listing of in, um, um, issues is understand everyone's interests. This is a critical step that is usually missing. Interests are the needs that you want satisfied by any given solution. We often ignore our true interests as we become attached to one particular solution. This is a time for active listening. So sometimes we're just set on the way something should be done and we completely just don't listen here or not present for other people. Um, listing possible solutions, they say that that's an, uh, an option uh, for brainstorming. I think we do really great with that. We're a brainstorming group. Um, and then evaluate, uh, what are the pluses and minuses? So going through that list and saying what's good, what's not so good, um, select an option. What's the best option in the balance? Is, is there a way to bundle a number of options together for a more satisfactory solution? Which I really like because it still expands how we could be creative and coming up with a solution that fits everyone. Um, and then document the agreement. I thought that this was really important because sometimes we say, oh, we got over this hurdle, this was great. Maybe a year or two from now, something similar might happen. And we can uh, you know, think about how we address this or if an issue came up with a particular person, we can see the, the documentation of this. And, we, and also it's an accountability practice for ourselves. Like how did we take care of this? Were we you know, listening and all that? So um, I like the uh, documentation piece and then agree on a contingency monitoring and evaluation, I think which is also important after you document it evaluating it is really important. So like, um, and then, and thinking about what that evaluation could look like. Um, yeah, how, what would that look like? Um, and it's room for improvement, right? So it doesn't mean that we have to be perfect, but that we document how it went and the next time we can learn from that. And then in improving your ability to resolve conflicts, um, I feel here being able to choose and apply the best conflict resolution strategy effectively is made possible by developing better conflict resolution skills. Examples are listening effectively, identify specific points of disagreement, express your own needs clearly, view conflict as an opportunity for growth. Um, I always think that any conflict is an opportunity for growth. And then I put three different resources there uh, negotiation and conflict resolution activities. Um, just have a, a several little activities that people can do. Um, the big book of conflict resolutions, and it's like a PDF that is a full book PDF that has a whole bunch of different um, stuff in there. And then conflict management training activities and icebreakers for adults. So some more um, activities. Again, some of them are made for like really large groups um, and for really big 
really big issues, but I think we could take stuff from there uh, and learn um, and some good icebreakers too, I think. Yeah. And I am done. <laughs> Thank you, Ignacia. That was wonderful. Um, uh, I I really look forward to checking out the resources you put out because that sounds really interesting. And um, you know what I was thinking about. I've I've been saying this thing that I I don't think a relationship does not start until its first conflict. So like, mm -hmm. um, and I've been trying to like kind of test that in my own personal relationships, romantic relationships, work relationships. You meet someone, you work with them, you're nice, everything is good and awesome and you know, all is well. Um, you don't, you're not having a relationship with that person. It starts when you have your first real conflict, where you actually have conflicting interests, right? And how you handle that will tell you everything you need to know about this relationship and whether it is a relationship if you come out the other side is resolving it. So, um, yeah, I, I I really appreciated the breakdown of like the steps and how it shows up in workplace. Yeah, I, yeah. I really liked how you like went through like, like I like theories and like the ways people like kind of outline different things. So I liked how you went through that because I feel like, like you said, there's always things to like pull from different theories and different like schools of thought even if it's not like applicable 100 percent so yeah yeah i was um thinking about you know the the three things we talked about perfectionism burnout and conflict resolution and i was thinking um when already when you were talking about perfectionism it's like the ideal of being uh and it's like the, the represents like it's supposed to like present re represent you in its totality and so I saw, I was thinking about how that's um, very much connected to possible conflict resolution because in, in sometimes imperfectionism, it's like you're situated with an idea because that's the way it has to be. And so that can create conflict with other people and then thereby also causing burnout because you have to continue that perfectionism Right, so it's like this this kind of cycle there. So I notice I notice that little cycle with starting with perfectionism. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. You know, it's also it's like and this is another pattern that I have around conflict that I noticed at some point was that um, I learned at some point that I cre conflict creates intimacy for me, and a conflict oh. resolution is is, is it, it creates intimacy for me, and for the longest time. Um, conflict resolution was the only source of intimacy because again, going back to like childhood trauma, because so much of um, my childhood was around, you know, was growing up in a conflict heavy household is I learned relationships to be about this like up and down of going through conflict. And then the resolution, like you were saying, it's not particularly a great resolution. It's one of those forms of either avoiding it or fighting it or just like all sorts of like dysfunctional behaviors around it. Um, and so I had to learn later, first of all, to separate, but like when I would enter relationships that did not have conflict, right? It, they did not feel intimate and real to me. Mm -hmm. uh, or if the conflict resolution was not dysfunctional in the ways that I was used to, it did not feel good. And so like, I, I keep thinking about that. And like, for example, you know, say you and I in our working relationships, right? Um, every once in a while, I'm like, we don't have any conflict. We never have conflict. And then, and then I'm reminded that no, that we have conflict. It's just the way that we resolve our conflict is, it has become so organic, right? It is functional. We actually like hear each other's interests. We make compromises. We understand whose needs need to be met in what ways. And the, co the conflicts are arising and are resolving as part of the relationship and it is functional, right? And it does create intimacy. It's not the only anchor of the relationship. <laughs> it's like, if I don't have conflict with you, then I feel like, you know, we are falling apart, right? So um, anyways, I was just like, it's, it, I, I'm trying to think about that as we 
again, these are these are all really big subjects that I'm, I'm looking forward to learning more about all of them. But thinking about how to do, how to be aware of the ways in which we do conflict resolution almost naturally as part of relationship building, right? Yeah, yeah. Not just like here is big conflict and here is big resolution, but it's like the relationship is um, taking care of the conflicts as we go. Yeah. It's funny because you just said, when you said we do have conflict, I was like, no, we don't. But it's because I don't see it as conflict. You know, like, because you sometimes you think of conflict in this very, very negative way. And like, like we can have conflict and it's like, I don't agree with that or something, you know, talk it out. So yeah, I, I think that um, I automatically think of this very negative thing and we work through those things pretty good, you know, just pretty seamless actually. Like, okay, let's talk it out. Um, one, one of the, the, the three things that I saw that um, uh, I guess connects with like, how, how we deal with some of these things are very simple. And I was like, what to do for perfectionism, burnout and conflict resolution, like take care of ourselves, learning and improving and, um, and creating like, like creating concrete uh, solutions that we can go to. But basically it's about taking care of ourselves and learning. Well, I feel like with the conflict thing, I like very much like resonate with like, I mean, my like childhood was a very high conflict household overall. So like, I feel like I also see conflict as a very negative thing. And mm -hmm. a lot of the time, like the patterns that my parents did were like, we have this huge explosive fight. Now we're going to pretend it didn't happen and just move on. And so like, that's a lot of what I did, like previously like I'd be like okay like this conflict happened now it's like over so like now I don't have to deal with the everything else so like yeah I'm learning some of those things and it's funny to be talking about this right the way we're talking about perfectionism burnout and conflict resolution and I, I feel like we're talking about this very differently right which we're we're talking about it as part of the heal project, but the way we're talking about it is about us, us, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, as um, how we how we're connecting and you know respecting one another um, uh, and growing with one another. Like I think it's just like what you said. It's no, that's not separate. It's not separate. These are this is um, we're consistently learning about ourselves, but in the organization with capitalist models, it doesn't really pan out. It doesn't, it's not talked about in that particular way. It's about, um, I'm generalizing here, but it's about more like productivity, you know, moving forward, getting shit done. Um, and, and I don't think that that's the way we, uh, we, we're not coming at it like that. I don't think we ever have actually. The work is absolutely important. But we've said from the beginning that our well-being goes above beyond, right? I think a big piece of it is that we we have taken a long time working on the trust piece. Um, and because the trust is there, when conflict comes up, we approach it from a place of compassion. Um, mm -hmm. Because there's that knowing, there, that there's that trust, right? Like... Um, did I trust that like we will make it through this? Uh, and these are, I'm, 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 no, I'm noticing at this point, I mean, again, it is, I'm trying hard to identify very subconscious patterns. Um, mm -hmm. And so when I look at my relationships where there is that trust, then conflict is not this huge event that disturbs me, triggers me uh, and, and pushes me into acting in all sorts of like fight, freeze, flight, fawn, like, it's not that, but rather it's, it's, it's deepening of the relationship is another step is in knowing, is another step in building trust. Um, and yeah, I appreciated what you said, Rita, about like conflict, avoiding conflict or looking at it as something that you just don't wanna deal with, right? How can I, I, I'm like personally, like one of my patterns has been the way I used to do conflict resolution is fawning is just like, you know, morphing myself into something shrinking or being something that I'm not completely overriding my own needs um, in order to make the other person feel better. 
um, <laughs> that, is, that is no conflict resolution. And so this was the very first skill share session number one. I think we did good. This is yeah. awesome. Yes. Perfectionism, conflict resolution. Thank you.